everyone. Welcome back to part two of our how-to on the Berks PPE Resource Network. In our first video, we talked a lot about high level, how to bring your community together in an effort to bring in all different folks with all different skill sets to come around um, providing PPE and important resources for our folks on the front line. Today, we want to talk a little bit more about the different areas um, and different skill sets needed to bring folks around these issues and to help move the needle on things in your community. Today, we'll meet with three others on the task force who can discuss some of the technical aspects of this project and talk through how to really build this project out quickly and um, make sure we cover all of the bases for you to answer all of your questions. Hello, I'm Adele Shade, and I'm going to talk about the scientific, legal, production and distribution processes of the Berks PPE Resource Network. And so to start off by talking about how do you pull together your scientific community behind a project of this scope, um, I think one important piece is to utilize social media, reach out to your network if you have um, scientific collaborators. And there's, there's different ways they can help. They can help with the technical uh, 3D printing uh, portions of this project, but on the other side, they can also help you continue to research the landscape of the crisis that you're dealing with. The landscape will be ever-changing, and you want to make sure you keep up with what's happening and what the needs of the community are scientifically. Second, the legal communications and legal verifications that you need at the time. For the Berks PPE network, we were dealing with face shields, masks, and straps that hold masks in place. And so what we needed to do is make sure we had attorneys communicate with the FDA because there were new emergency protocols coming out every other day. And so making sure what we were creating was appropriate, that we followed all of the federal and state guidelines, and that we had people looking at the materials we were using to verify they would be okay for human use during this crisis was very important. Next um, category I'd like to talk about are our production procedures for the Berks PPE network. And we were, again, producing um, products that were 3D printed. So if we start at the beginning, we had to reach out to people who had the technical expertise to do this 3D printing. That um, was possible for us because uh, I run a nonprofit science research institute where we have scientific collaborations going on all the time. So reaching out to that network to start the businesses, the school districts, the local colleges and universities was our first step. Once we had those people and we recognized who they were, then we had to let them know what to do. And so creating a team that could look at models that were out there and what exactly we wanted these people to print and do. We had to form a smaller team, which we referred to then as our engineering team, to put out the information for the others to follow. As this progressed through time, there were more and more people volunteering right now. Um, at this point, we have 93 people who are volunteering, and so we needed a lead, lead group um, so that we had everybody moving in the same direction and doing the same thing. Once we have the instructions ready and people were starting to produce, we needed a place for them to record how much they produced because that would dictate what we could in turn give out and distribute to the organizations that needed it. So we created online forms for this, which we had um, compiled into spreadsheets so that our groups behind the scenes could take that information and organize it uh, for distribution. So we created a completion log for our makers to, to log what they have. We established drop-off procedures for those products that they made. Uh, that had to be highly regulated during the COVID crisis because of social distancing. So we have procedures in place for people to drop their things off one time a week and then we needed to um, also put together something where once they drop those things off, we needed to package them correctly with our correct labeling, again, um, 
keeping ourselves aware of what the FDA emergency COVID requirements were and have everything ready to go for our people that we're picking up. I was lucky that I um, am involved in the scientific community um, in Berks County, and so I had that network and those contacts created. Depending on the situation and the crisis, you might have to identify the nonprofits in your county to go to the organizations, the companies, or um, another suggestion would be to look for local colleges and universities if they have established crisis teams who can help you when you start to form these types of initiatives. Address the requesting organizations. So these are organizations that need the, the PPE. What we did, again, is mobilize the social media network, government officials, um, anyone we could to get the word out about what we're doing. And then we created another online form for their requests to come in so that they could be compiled into a database and that we could keep an eye on those numbers as the days went on. Uh, after that, we established pickup procedures. And again, these were very um, specific to social distancing for this COVID uh, environment. And those were also communicated to these organizations through um, either social media or email distributions from their registration with us. So to make something like this happen, you need money. And what we were fortunate, again, is that we have a network here in Brooks County um, of collaborators that is very close with the nonprofit world. Um, two suggestions I would have for gathering the funds that you need to do something like this in a crisis. The first would be if you have a nonprofit involved that has existing uh, nonprofit status that where you can um, kind of single out the money that is specifically donated for the crisis and you being able to address the crisis, you could go through an established nonprofit. What we did was create a fund under our community foundation, the Berks County Community Foundation, so that we knew that all the money going into that fund was going specifically to this project. And I think that's really important to remember in a crisis is that when people or companies or other nonprofits donate money, they want to be sure it goes exactly to the crisis that's being addressed. And so it's important that you earmark that money specifically for what it's donated for. The other thing which is important um, is that community members will want to donate to your cause. So any way you can to make it easy for them. Online donations with credit cards, try to avoid cash so you have records of what's happening and that you can get them uh, IRS letters for their, their nonprofit donations. The benefit of organizing an initiative of this scope, uh, I think goes far beyond the immediate need that we're providing with the, the PPE for this crisis. We have students right now who are working from home and they're working with their parents and their grandparents to help their community. We have organizations that are reaching out and working together that maybe didn't work together before. And so I think those unintended consequences of this community effort can be longstanding after this crisis is over. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Spohn. I'm the Director of Operations and Project Development for Hamburg Area School District. And my role here was to be able to provide the supplies and logistical network so that we can keep feeding the machines and building the product. Um, the, the supplies and materials that we were looking for started off with a basic plan that came from uh, one of our volunteers. Uh, and then the feedback loops that were, that were connecting the users with the designers provided us with problems that we had to solve. So we were regularly brainstorming within our small group as well as reaching out to the business partnerships that we already had established uh, leading up to these crises. Uh, as a school district, uh, we regularly would work closely with Greater Reading Chamber Alliance and Ellen for workforce and talent development. We'd work with our businesses for internships and uh, other opportunities for our students to get into the, the workforce. So those relationships were already there. We knew who to pick up the phone and, and talk to as subject matter experts who could help us through some of these, these problem areas. Uh, a lot of this 
uh, of the materials that we were really looking for came from uh, the end user saying, here's what I need, here's my problem, and then just a bunch of people sharing that information via text or on the Facebook uh, group so that we could come up with some ideas, and then it was just a matter of Google search and, and talking to partners. My name is Chris Jackson. I'm co-founder of Cross Trainer Mixed Reality and co-manager of the Goggleworks uh, Virtual Reality Lab, which is where our uh, base of operations is. Um, I was in charge of uh, managing production and prototyping for the project. We basically looked at what the problem was, which uh, was a lack of um, PPE um, and, and requests in the thousands. Um, and we arrived at a, a model that we could print um, in large quantities. Um, it wasn't necessarily the best piece of uh, PPE you could print, but it was the one we could produce the, the most units of. My job uh, in, in the lab is, since I'm, the Gogworks is the, the location where most of the printers that were being loaned to us from school districts were, were arriving. I needed to make sure that the printers were constantly printing. Um, but since some of these prints would take quite a while, um, I would have time to get information out to the group. So we used Facebook, um, our Facebook group, we would use that to disseminate information. Um, if someone would come up with a, a solution to a problem, um, I would get my, my phone out and I would record a video and I would basically get that video right out to the group so the group understood how to make something or fix something or um, print something in a certain way. Um, we, very early on, we had a smaller, we, we basically had a smaller task force made up of engineers um, and people with a lot of experience with 3D printing and that group became the kind of go-to uh, on the prototyping stage. So. As the product changed, we needed to make sure that the product wasn't getting too large and, and would prevent the, the, the output that we were getting every week. So we had to basically design it in a way um, where it wouldn't impact the numbers, uh, the weekly numbers that we were trying to get out to the uh, first responders. The one good thing about the pandemic is people were at home. So we, we, we understood we had, um, people would probably have a lot more time to print with their families. Um, and um, in my business, I, I tip, I'm, I'm used to working with partners that uh, vir virtually. So I, I have partners over in Poland and, and in different states. So I'm very, it, I'm very comfortable with, with managing um, people that I don't have to keep my eye on. And I think that's the one good thing is people are learning how to do that right now because a lot of people are working from home remotely doing Zoom meetings and basically doing a lot of work that way. So. I think that in the future with something like this is gonna, is gonna help quite a bit. Um, we try to, to get the product out uh, into the field. Um, we, I would arrange that with Chris Spohn. Chris would come down and pick up the product. Um, we had uh, pe people in the uh, law enforcement that some really big guys and we wanted to try, try the, uh, the, the initial masks on them. We found out we needed a larger model um, and we needed to produce a larger model that could still fit on everyone's um, printing plate. So the, the prototype team worked on that, and then we took those revisions out into the, back out in the field. Uh, we did something similar with nurses where um, we had a, 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 a local um, sewing team that would kind of come in, and I would drop off product with them. They would disseminate that to a team of nurses, and then we would get feedback the next day or two we would encourage them to all join the PPE network so they could basically provide that feedback uh, right uh, in the forums or uh, via forms that, that are available on the, the website and on the PPE network. In closing, what we've hoped to convey by talking about the many different, different facets of this group um, is how important communication is throughout the process, whether you're dealing with volunteers, community partners, local school districts, bringing in your business community, um, you know, weaving in all of those many different conversations that need to be had at a lot of different levels. I feel it's important to have different channels to reach different audiences. So be it the Facebook group or a string of emails or sharing this video, we understand that communication is key and there are many different tools and ways to communicate with one another to be efficient, to get very quick feedback, and to make sure that we're always looping back to make sure that there's a constant feedback loop both for the users and the designers of this material. And so we hope that as we explain all of this to you, whether we're in a pandemic or any other type of crisis moving forward in your community, um, the many important methods and ways to 
um, you know, work together, build a strong group in a very small amount of time, and to be able to really move this work forward in a way that benefits the community in so many different ways beyond just the problem at hand. Um, information for that is listed on the screen here, and we hope that you'll use that as a tool in moving forward. We have multiple forms on our website and tons of information on there, and we're updating it every day to be able to help you to implement this in your community.